Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Insects like to eat plants, but spiders eat insects. Today we are talking about our eight-legged friends. Also, rodents can be destructive. We'll show you how to control them. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Andy Williams. Andy is the director out at Lichterman Nature Center. And Mr. D is here. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. All right. Hello. Andy, you have spiders, and I'll try not to scream throughout the segment. <laughs> um, so what do we need to know about the spiders? Because they are beneficial, right? They are. And that's, okay. the, that's the, the, the point if you can get past your phobias about yeah. spiders. Yeah. I mean, next to snakes, they're some of the most misunderstood creatures on the planet. Mm -hmm. They have just really uh, undeserved reputations. But the more you know about them, of course, you know, it's my thing anyway. <laughs> right. the, the, the more you know about them, the more interesting they are. Uh -huh. uh, to start with, in broad strokes, they're arthropods. Uh, they're uh, related to insects, but they're not insects. Okay. Insects typically have three legs, three body parts. Uh, but spiders uh, are arachnids, and, and spiders and their relatives, and they have eight legs, they have two body parts, and some uh, other interesting equipment. Yeah. So this is not a native spider, this is actually a, a blonde tarantula from the wow. Sonoran Desert. But we use it because it's the large size. Our native spiders tend to live, most of them just live a single year, but they, okay. their life cycles tend to, uh, they live between one to uh, three uh, years. Uh, so this time of the year, they're, they're kind of on the small side, and so it's very helpful to have live spiders okay. that live longer. These uh, sure. uh, tarantulas can live 5, 10, 20 years, I and mean, they're very long-lived. Wow. Uh, they're typically females. Okay. Most uh, 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 spiders are sexually dimorphic. In other words, there are very distinct differences between the males and females, okay. and the females are, are larger and live longer, which is oh, <laughs> kind of a lesson there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you really can't uh, uh, tell really clearly uh, here that it has eight eyes, but the eyes are on the part called the uh, 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 cephalothorax, which is kind of a head chest. Okay. They have eight legs, uh, eight eyes. They're more sensitive to um, uh, light and dark, although jumping spiders can see up to eight inches. They have uh, uh, pedipalps, a large, uh, uh, that looks like a first set of legs, and inside they have fangs. All The fangs are connected <laughs> connected to venom glands. All spiders are venomous. All spiders, spiders are venomous. venomous. Okay. However, not all spiders are uh, venomous, is deleterious to humans, but every time you talk about spiders, you know, you really have to talk about the brown recluse sure. and, and, and the black widow, which are also found in the gardens and you really don't necessarily want. The black widows are distinctive. They've got the hourglass uh, mm -hmm. marking and that sort of stuff. Spiders will eat anything and so they eat the males, they eat other spiders, of oh, course they yes. eat everything. The brown recluse, we won't go into too much detail about it at this point, but they're uh, small, wispy brown spiders that hang out uh, uh, in your closets and all like that, and you really yeah. want to avoid them. Uh, but anyhow, those are the two no-nos, but most of the other spiders uh, that we have, and there are thousands of them, people tell us that you're never more than three, week, three feet away from a spider, your house, your garden, everywhere. But the good news is, is they eat bugs, and they eat lots of bugs. Okay. Uh, we, in the south, we have three general types of spiders. Uh, we have uh, the very familiar uh, uh, web spinning spiders or mm -hmm. web uh, 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 weaving. Uh, all spiders have silk glands they use to not only trap their prey but also provide habitat. Mm. They use it in a variety of interesting ways. Uh, but uh, these orb weaving spiders will just lay in their uh, webs and wait for something to, uh, to come into it. Let's see if we can get him down a little bit. This is our native wolf spider, which they get, ter not terrifying, but they get very large. See if I can get that around yeah, where we can see it. Yeah. They, they get larger yeah. later, and you know they, they look more like our friend the tarantula. Mm -hmm. 
And this is so tiny you can't see it this time. This is a jumping spider that jumps around and uh, grabs its prey. Okay. Another spider that a lot of people only find out by mistake but are fairly common are the crab type spiders. Uh, the crab type spiders have very, well, they look like little miniature crabs. Mm -hmm. Crabs are also arthropods, but they're crustaceans. Huh. Okay. So they're, they're related, but not really the same thing. Okay. But you can see it's got its legs uh, in a crab like position. Uh, so, anyhow, those are three basic types of spiders. Okay. They eat and hunt differently. Uh, like we talked about these weight and flowers, and in the summer, some of them are beautiful. They're white, they're green, they're red, they're pink. They're, they mimic the flowers and they Camp ambush and catch things in, in, yeah. in the flowers. Wow, so they mimic the flowers. Yeah, well, they mimic the colors of the, the flowers. Colors are the same. Yeah. And they just the chill out, stay still, and they move with amazing speed. Now, uh, they have a, a little bit better eyesight than some, but a lot of orb weaving spiders uh, just respond to motion. In fact, on the tarantulas, you know, they're known for the hair, those, yeah. the, the, the hair like. Uh, 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 things on their legs are very sensitive to sound and vibration. Wow. But another myth about spiders is basically they are, are um, you know, arachnid vampires. <laughs> they, they, you know, they got their fangs, they go and they just bite something, they suck the juice out of it and go on to the next. <laughs> and actually that's not true. <laughs> but it, it, it makes them even more terrifying sounding. Yeah. You know, the truth is that all spiders, to some extent, digest uh, at least part of the, what they eat. Uh, just uh, anyhow, if you, you can see this on your own, if you go out to the garden, you look at a, uh, throw something into like a garden spider or something, and watch it eat. It will use the fangs first to um, uh, uh, penetrate and kill the uh, prey. They may wrap it a little bit webbing while they're waiting for it to die. Okay. But then they will go, and I think we've got, yeah. see if we can get him around where he can be seen by the camera. This is actually a brown recluse, and unfortunately he's decided to crawl down on the bottom. Wow, but uh, if you look in there, you can see he's actually got a wolf spider right. uh, uh, in his uh, palps. What he's done after he knew he killed the wolf spider, he, he, he grabbed it and they actually regurgitate digestive fluids oh. onto the outside and they take uh, uh, their uh, palps and their jaws and they macerate it, they get the digestive juices in it and they eat it that way. Now, uh, oh, things God. like the wolf spiders and um, you know, tarantulas, you know, the hunters, a lot of them will tear the prey apart and eat bits and pieces, although you will see wings and legs and, you know, the less, <laughs> the, I hate to say less juicy parts, but, <laughs> yeah, but the parts that they can't chew as well. Um, uh, the crab spiders have another way of uh, going about it. They're, they have exceedingly strong fangs, and their fangs pierce the uh, shell of an insect with the exoskeleton, the external covering. Uh, they will go, it not only inject some venom, but also they will throw up some digestive juices inside it. And so after it's dead, and it'll start digesting from the inside out, and they'll uh, suck out the digestive, uh, uh, partially digestive stuff out of the inside. But anyhow, they, uh, wow. what, so that's how they eat, but what do they eat? They primarily eat bugs, and garden pests are among their favorite sure. foods. Uh, there are some of the hunters will uh, have to be specialists as far as diet, but almost any uh, web weaving spider will eat whatever goes into its web. The webs don't hurt the plant, so you want to attract them. Uh, you'll need to talk some tall plants for them to put their webs on. Also provide some mulching cover for these hunting insects uh, to uh, provide cover and go out and hunt and do their thing. Abby, that was great. <laughs> we appreciate that. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. about the spiders, now Mr. D, moles, voles, and chipmunks. So let's start with the moles first. Let's do start with the moles. Okay. That's actually a, a success story. I can tell you okay. some good things about the moles. Uh, I, this past week I caught three in my yard, and that's probably about seven that I've caught this year, <laughs> using uh, the same scissors type mold trap I've had for several years. Okay. But there, it's pretty easy to catch moles if you, if you simply try to set your trap over a long tunnel that doesn't have any branches off to the side. And you set your trap over that tunnel and you should catch one. If you don't, if you don't catch one within two days, move it. Don't leave it there for a week. You know, give it a couple of days to do that. And with that being said, here's actually a video of you showing us how to set up the mold trap. 
Looks like we uh, have a little bit of a mole problem here. Uh, WKNO has its own mole. That's good. We'll see if we can take care of it. You need to understand a little bit about moles before you try to trap them. A little bit about their biology and and uh, their feeding habits. Uh, primary diet of a mole is an earthworm and uh, they do eat white grubs and, and other soil insects but earthworms are their primary diet. They have uh, one mole can tunnel up to 225 feet in one night. Uh, they have a voracious appetite. They're uh, carnivorous and, and, and the uh, they have different types of tunnels. The long tunnel that doesn't have any lateral tunnels off to the side is probably a transportation tunnel. It, of course, he could be feeding, and he probably is feeding as he's going down through that transportation tunnel. The tunnels that have a lot of lateral tunnels off to the side, it looks like he's kind of confused or wandering around. Well, that is a feeding tunnel. He's probably in an area where there are a lot of earthworms, and he just is, uh, that's the buffet. He's, uh, he's enjoying the food. Now, the place to set a trap is not in one of the feeding tunnels because he may not come back to this area for a long time. Um, the place to set a trap is over a transportation tunnel, a tunnel that he uses going from his den to the feeding area, to the feeding ground. And what I look for, if I can't, you know, ideally I would come out here every night for two or three nights and mash all these tunnels down and then the next morning go out and look at the tunnel that was raised, flag it, and, uh, and uh, do that for two or three days and then the tunnel that's raised every night tells me that is definitely a transportation tunnel and you'll probably be 100% effective in catching a, a mole. I don't have time to do that, so I look for a long tunnel, like this right here, we got four feet of this tunnel that doesn't have any side branches off. So that tells me that may very well be a transportation tunnel and that's where I set my trap. If I'm successful uh, in a day or two, good. If not, I probably judge this incorrectly and I'll move my trap somewhere else. I don't ever leave a trap, an unsprung trap, in over a couple of days in an area. But it's important that you set the trap correctly. This has a couple of scissors on it. The way it's designed, when you set the trap, it actually opens a channel for these scissors to work. You be sure you set the scissors so that they will open up perpendicular to the runway. If you set it that way, that's the wrong way the, the, the mole can still get through. So you set, you push this down into the tunnel, snug it down there pretty good. It's really very, very simple. And you carefully put your foot on it and you push it down. As you're pushing it down, those scissors are opening and I'm making sure that the trigger stays pretty much in the center, over the center of that tunnel. Push it down until it clicks and it's set. So we're ready. We are in the hunting mode right now. Those scissors have opened up and they're, and they're ready to go. And when the, the mole will, even though that's pushed down, the mole will raise that tunnel again. And when it raises that trigger, you'll have your mole and it won't last very long. Just as important as learning how to set a trap correctly is learning how to spring that trap without getting your fingers cut off. So be, be very, very careful with that. And the way I do it, and this is, I'm not sure this is approved, an approved method, I know where those scissors are, so I make sure I keep my fingers away from that trigger. Now pull it out of the ground. Either side will work. Work it out of the ground. Okay, see the triggers is still, you can see the scissors. That's, that's in mole catching mode. Usually it hits the ground before it does that, but I, I keep my fingers away from the scissors and just toss it on the ground and it'll, it'll, it's ready to go. Okay, and we have Andy here, and guess what he brought us so we can see, because most folks have never seen a mole never or seen mole. mole. So, well, this is actually the Eastern Mole. Uh, the, you can see it's got you know long snouts, pretty sensitive, large. Uh, the, the front paws are designed for uh, moving through the dirt easily. The fur uh, goes in one direction. It's super, it's super soft, and I mean it actually feels good. It, it, <laughs> you have some glide through the tunnels. Okay. Uh, they, uh, the, you know, they're ubiquitous in the south. They love, they eat insects. Well, sure. they a lot of grubs, but I think their favorite food may be earthworms. Right. 
And so the best way to attract them to your yard is to have a beautiful <laughs> sand of grass. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You don't use uh, uh, many uh, pesticides. You know, that just brings them in like sending the bat signal up. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, now what else did you bring us, Andy? Well, I also uh, uh, brought two things up. This is actually a shrew. Okay. As you can tell, the shrew looks like the mole. Uh, it's in, uh, it eats insects as well, but it doesn't tend to dig as much as the, as the moles do. They'll dig occasionally, but they primarily use the tunnels that are uh, made by the moles, and they'll also fall some of the tracks made by voles, with oh, a V, okay. um, that uh, actually will eat your plants. It, they're easily mistaken, but if you look carefully, you can tell uh, very quickly that they have very different front yeah. legs. These are not designed for, for burrowing. They do have the same sort of snout, but they're substantially smaller. Okay. Uh, a vole, uh, which yeah. we'll talk about in a yeah. little bit, is also a rodent. It tends to be a little lighter brown, and uh, this, it's sort of uh, you know, roughly halfway in size between uh, the size of a shrew and a mole. Last but not least, our chipmunk. Oh, oh the chipmunk. <laughs> uh, yeah, another uh, uh, garden animal. Both the chipmunks and the uh, moles dig, and they tend to be solitary except when they're breeding. Hmm. The moles will bring, uh, breed once a year, typically in the spring. The chipmunks, sometimes they have uh, uh, two batches. Uh, they look cute on cartoons and all that sort of stuff, but, <laughs> but, but they yeah. do dig up your garden. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're omnivorous, uh, but they will preferentially eat a lot of vegetables and stuff, and they can carry food in their, in their cheeks. They have yeah. pouches uh, a, a great way. Uh, moles uh, have really high energy demands. Uh, they run around the yard eating uh, all the time, and they don't store food. You know, they just kind of go to deeper uh, areas to look for food when the weather gets colder. All right, we appreciate that, Andy. Now, Mr. D, how about control? Well, you know, uh, another, th another thing you were talking about, the energy needs mm -hmm. of the mole, they can eat 70 to 100% of their body yes. weight per day yeah, that's a lot. of insects. And uh, like you said, mostly earthworms is what they like. They have a real narrow, you notice the rear uh, hindquarters are, are more narrow than the front, and that enables them to very easily turn around in their tunnel mm -hmm. that they just dug. Uh, but they're interesting critters. Have you ever heard of making a mountain out of a molehill? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know what a molehill is. Well, that's the the hole that they dig when during dry weather conditions. They and they're they're still tunneling underground, but you can't see the tunnel, and the dirt has to go somewhere. Okay. But, yeah, let's uh, make sure we get a control while we have just a little time left. Well, the control just uh, set a trap, scissors type trap is the one yeah. that I found to be successful, uh, and set it uh, correctly over a long span of uninterrupted tunnel. If it's got a lot of side tunnels off to the side of it, it's a feeding tunnel and the right. mole may not be but be there. Set the trap and if you don't catch anything in two days, move it to another one and just kind of keep doing that and you will eventually have success. Okay, and now what about for the voles and the chipmunks? <laughs> voles and chipmunks, you know, uh, voles are, uh, both, both of them are rodents of course. Voles, uh, you can use uh, rodenticides. Uh, they're cleared for use on voles. Uh, I, I have some vole damage under one of my apple trees. I noticed mm. I was pulling the, some of the weeds back and leaves back from my apple trees. And that's one thing that will help prevent that damage or stop that damage because they like to be covered up and they like weeds to be there. And I pull all that out. I'm going to try that. Mm -hmm. And if I still continue to have uh, molds uh, or voles present there, then I will put a rodenticide uh, out mm -hmm. to try to take care of it. Uh, the chipmunks, uh, they're, even though they're a rodent, um, there are no, none of the rodenticides are cleared for use yeah. on chipmunks. Uh, so uh, exclusion methods, you know, try to chase them out. Um, you, know, not a, you know, not a whole lot to do. And they can do you some damage. Uh, uh, they take my four-wheel drive out of my hunting vehicle every year and I have to take it to my mechanic to get it fixed every year before hunting season starts. If you've got a vehicle that just sits out and you don't drive it a lot during the summertime, look out. All right, well, we appreciate that, Andy, Mr. D. Now is our Q&A session. Andy, we want you to join us. Sure. All right. Here's the first of your email. How do I protect my strawberries from birds? I put stakes with bird netting over my patch. It was not working well, so I put taller stakes with another layer of netting. I've had silver tape tied on and added more. Still, they are eating through the net. Help, says Miss Elizabeth. Mr. D, help. What kind of birds do you have? <laughs> you know, I'd like to see, I mean, if you do a good job of putting netting around and seal it real good, and I don't understand how the birds are getting through there, unless you have the net so close to the fruit that the birds are able to pick through the netting. I, don't, I really don't understand that, and, you know, and that's the only thing I can think of. I would try frightening agents, try an yeah. artificial mole, an artificial snake, 
that looks yeah, but they know. become habituated so the you know you've got yeah, to move, you that move, around that, move it around that's right but I, i'm with you with if you're having mechanical trolls like that they're not working i would re-examine my technique right you need some engineering you may yeah. just need a, a somebody with some engineering experience to try <laughs> to improve that mechanical exclusion method mm -hmm. all right there you have it miss elizabeth here's our next question while pulling up weeds in my yard, I discovered several grub worms. What do you recommend I use to get rid of them? A mole. Ah, I'm <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Mole. Yeah. We're waiting for that one. I saw yeah. Andy. I saw yeah, yeah, yeah. your face. Clearly, she has environmentally sustainable yeah. uh, gardening uh, techniques. There, there so. yeah. uh, actually, there are several I pulled from the Red Book, oh. 2015, uh, the page uh, that. Uh, gives the control methods mm -hmm. and one of the first the f actually the first thing on the list is something we've been using for years and years and years and years to control grub worms and that's carboril yeah. uh, garden tech uh, granules two percent granules uh, will do a good job they're easy to kill uh, you know they come out at night if you scatter the the pesticide out on the lawn at you know late afternoon you know you'll actually see the dead mm -hmm. grubs on, on the surface mm -hmm. of the ground but there are other grub X uh, uh, the Maxide is a product, Bayer Advanced 24-hour grub killer. Uh, uh, those are the ones that are listed to control both the larvae of the green June beetles uh, and uh, the larvae of uh, the uh, May beetles, Schaefer's Japanese beetle. I can't tell them apart. Yeah. The white, yeah. white grubs are all the larvae of all yeah. of these different well, scarab beetles. Yeah, well, two things to throw in there. The grubs are actually larva beetles. They'll so produce something right. later that, are, that is some of which can be beneficial. Mm. I'd also, uh, before you uh, applaud uh, pesticides, so I'd see if they're doing any harm. You know, did, are, That's good. Are, are you concerned that they're there or you're concerned that you're seeing a decline in your vegetables or your garden? That's a good point. And, a, and it could be a, tr a, a terrible to the point. That's a good point. They're probably in everybody's yard if they've got any are. organic matter at all. And and honestly, uh, I can only think of a couple of times in my career where they I've seen enough damage that I would recommend treating. I mm -hmm. uh, saw it in a farmer's pasture one time, and they were completely killing his his Bermuda grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and but most of the time, most of the time, you can live with the damage that they create. Okay. All right. So here's our next question: Are ants harmful in a vegetable garden? As he takes off his glasses here. Yeah. There's a couple of schools of thought. And, you know, uh, you know we, earlier we were looking at some aphids on some tomatoes, and ants like aphids. Aphids secrete honeydew. It's kind of a sweet, sticky substance, mm -hmm. and ants will actually kind of protect those aphids. And uh, ants are omnivorous, which means they can uh, be carnivorous, but they're omnivorous. They eat both plant material and uh, 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 other insects. So if they're eating an insect, they're beneficial and you're probably okay to leave them there. Uh, with their feeding on plant material like okra, uh, uh, tomatoes, tomatoes, fire ants are probably maybe an example that can be beneficial, but if there are so many out there that they're bothering you when you're picking peas, mm -hmm. you know, then they're not beneficial. So there are some products uh, that that you can use some of the baits and and that you know if they're if they're bothering you and you want to get rid of them yes you can kill them and they are products that are labeled for use in home gardens, but uh, uh, I would wait and you know try to determine whether or not they're doing you more harm than good. You know, they they may be doing you more good than harm and if that's the case leave them be. Just leave them be. All right, here's our next question. This is a good one. Does the soil lab you often speak of test? For lead, did he? No, it does not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Our the UT soil test lab checks for uh, nutrients that mm -hmm. plants need, and if you want to have uh, an analysis done for lead, you'll need to go with one of the the private labs around, uh, like ANL lab A &L. in Memphis, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's the one that's local that I'm aware of. Yeah. But uh, there are other labs around that will specifically test for what you ask them to test for. It'll be more than four dollars a sample. I <laughs> yeah, typically, yeah, lead they, they, they use techniques that have really low detection limits because you're interested in lower levels of lead than you would uh, be uh, nutrients, and so there's a lot of hard costs that go into that. Not only the equipment, but also to prevent cross contamination mm -hmm. because lead's so ubiquitous. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, a few years ago, we did some gardens in the urban areas, and we checked the soil and. Uh, uh, it was kind of surprising that most of the pHs of the soil was high, but it was because there's so much white uh, gravel around and, yeah. and, and you know, the limestone had raised the pH. But 
There was other analysis done in almost all of them because they were in old houses yeah. around almost all of them had you know, fairly high levels of lead. lead yeah. uh, or, or I say high levels of lead, uh, just the presence of the paint, the lead yeah, paint. It's not endogenous. You know, it's parts per million, right. and, you know, parts right. per billion yeah. and you know, very awesome. low level. All right, Andy, Mr. D, we're out of time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, grinding in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.